You're all very good. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, I'm not Steve McMenamin. Um, uh, Steve is traveling, sends his best regards to everybody, um, and asked me to sit in on his behalf. Um, as you know, my name is Ken Schuer. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Today's event is the continuing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our topic this morning is systematic trading strategies, past, present, and future. I'm not sure which one of you is the past, the present, and the future, but we'll figure that one out. Um, as a courtesy to our speakers, when we're finished, if you would please fill out your cards to give us your feedback on the session. Uh, we have three of the very best thinkers on this important topic, um, all doing some very different things as it pertains uh, to the to systematic and, um, tra and systematic trading strategies. Uh, let me introduce our speakers, and then I'll ha hand it over to our moderator, George Coplin. Uh, Toby Crable founded Crable Capital Management in 1992. He's the firm's chief executive officer and chief investment officer. After studying finance at Florida Technology University, Toby joined Chicago-based RBNH Financial Services in 1980, where he traded customer accounts using a discretionary approach. RBNH was followed by four years of publishing a commodity advisory letter, The Active Trader, devoted to his explaining his observations of price behavior. In 1989, he authored the book Day Trading with Short-Term Price Patterns and Opening Range Breakouts. In 1991, Toby joined Niederhofer Investments, where he conducted research and traded for Victor Niederhofer while continuing to manage a small customer portfolio that he brought with him. John Taylor is the chairman, CEO, and founder of FX Concepts. He has over 40 years of experience. I'm happy to hear that there's somebody in the room who's been in the business longer than me. Uh, in foreign exchange and related fixed income markets, he is recognized as an expert in the management of foreign exchange and a pioneer in the analysis of cyclicality of foreign exchange and interest rate markets. Prior to founding FX Concepts, John was a vice president at Citibank, where he headed the bank's marketing and advisory services in foreign exchange. John began his career at Chemical Bank, where he founded that bank's foreign exchange advisory service in 1972. In this capacity, he was the author of the Foreign Exchange Exposure Management, which was published by Chemical Bank. In addition, John developed the first computer models designed to assist multinational corporations in the management of foreign exchange risk. John's executive responsibilities at FX Concepts include serving as its chief investment officer. He also continues to provide analytical input daily and is available for client contact. John has had numerous articles published in investment management journals and is an accomplished speaker widely noted for his skills in forecasting currency relationships. Michael Harris is, the, is, the, is the currently the president of Campbell & Company. He joined the company in July of 2000 and was appointed president in October of last year. Mr. Harris, or sorry, Mike, formally held the position of deputy manager of trading in 2004, director of trading in 2006, and was appointed to the firm's investment committee in March of 2010. He previously worked as a, as a futures and options broker for Refco from 1999 to 2000, and in with, within the sales and product development groups at Morgan Stanley, um, managed futures from 1997 to 1999. Our moderator today is George Coplet, who is nervous that I'm gonna say something nasty about him, and I will. Um, uh, he is the portfolio manager and style head for trading strategies at LGT. Prior to joining LGT in 2007, George worked at Ivy Asset Management in New York, where he was strategy head for tactical trading strategies. Prior to Ivy, he was responsible for model development at Stonebrook Structured Products, a registered CTA, which he joined in 2000, following his tenure at a firm called Kenmar. And he learned his trade at the knee of Melissa Cohn, who is still at Kenmar 25 years later. Um, the best five years of my life. <laughs> the best five years of your life. You see, he's really afraid of her. It's, it's, still, it's still there. <laughs> so with that, George, would you set the table for us and um, give us an introduction to where we're going to go this morning? Sure. So what, if I could borrow this one. Here you go. That's good. So the topic of uh, today's panel is uh, systematic trading, past, present, and future. 
And as I, so you can tell from Ken's introduction, we have people that have been involved in this business for a very long time, uh, have been able to grow as times have changed, uh, as technology has changed, um, as, um, as regulations have changed, uh, and they've been able to adapt and adapt in a very positive way as they're all very successful uh, fund managers in their own right. Uh, we would also like them to talk about how it is that they see the industry changing, the challenges that are on the horizon, the things that they have been planning for probably for the past 10 years are probably, are probably starting to come to fruition now, uh, and the things uh, that they're planning for now are, are, are the ones that are going to be uh, somewhere on the horizon in the future. So we would love uh, and we hope to hear about that from them as well. So I think that uh, a good place to start, and, and as Ken also really suggested, we have people from different backgrounds. So, uh, so Toby and uh, his firm, Crable, is, is uh, more in the shorter term trading space, uh, more broadly diversified markets. Uh, whereas John Taylor and FX Concepts uh, focuses uh, really exclusively on currency markets. They do a little bit outside of that, but that, that has historically been their bread and butter. Uh, and then finally, Mike Harris with, with a firm uh, that has been trading uh, a trend-following strategy for 41 years. Uh, it's a completely, uh, you know, completely different view than what we will hear, hopefully, from Toby and, and from Mike. So there will be some differences of opinions, hopefully, uh, and there will be some questions that come out of this that we would be happy to address at the end of um, each of the managers' presentations. And with that, Toby, can we can begin with this. Thanks, George. Nice to see you, Ken and Melissa. Um, I, I love trading. That's the George has asked me to talk a little bit about myself. That's the passion that I brought to the business when I began and. The uh, let me try to remember the mid 70s, and uh, uh, that I still have, and I hope to have for the rest of my career. Um, I'm fascinated by price movement. Um, there's not much I can do with an analysis of the Federal Reserve's actions uh, that really doesn't feed into what I'm doing, other than the fact that they're irrational and they provide me with a lot of opportunity. It's probably the reason why I have a business in the first place. The chaos that, that exists in the regulatory arena has provided a market movement that probably wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, but that's a different story. So I, uh, I look at price action and have uh, from the beginning uh, in, the, in 1980, after a three or four year tennis career, uh, I, I went to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and restarted my career as a runner and uh, started doing analysis, technical analysis of the markets at that time and within a couple of months started working for one of the floor traders that needed, uh, needed an a analyst. And at that time it was kind of an open-ended uh, world in Chicago. There was a lot of opportunity and, and uh, it it gave me a chance to kind of make my my own way. The uh, um, I started trading his capital through his accounts, which were essentially floor broker rates, and because he owned the brokerage firm, it was a zero rate. So it it pushed me in the direction of very very short term trading. And the word around the office was, you know, ring the cash register, and it was uh, intraday, and uh, you don't, you didn't sit around and wait for uh, some sort of long-term profit in a trade. So that that colored my my world, so to speak. Uh, and thereafter, I, I really had difficulty moving away from that that type of thinking. So s through the '80s, I um, I tried. A, a lot of different things, including market letter writing and advising floor traders, and also in, at the same time thinking about how to apply this kind of short-term uh, mentality to a business, a, a management business. And um, 
It wasn't easy. Uh, it was, and it was necessary to quantify uh, what I was doing. And I searched out a mentor and went to work for Victor Niederhofer. And I, he was one of the best in the quantitative business, although he's not quantitative himself in, in many respects. But he had a, a very good research platform and a tremendous database, that, which gave me an opportunity to really look into what it was that uh, I thought was 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 going to work in the in the in the trading, and verified some very uh, some some very interesting, powerful, basic concepts about price action, and uh, that really felt like uh, I had built a foundation and had a structure for uh, a management business uh, at that point. Um, so I kind of limped out of his shop with a, f a few million dollars under management and uh, made a go of it, and uh, it it has built from there. In 1995, the it, it became clear with the demands of the shorter term trading as I developed more systems and started to trade more markets that it was necessary for me to automate the processes, and that was a very very important uh, element for our company's well being. The the uh, I really I think it's almost it's almost impossible to do this on a discretionary basis. You just cannot get enough diversification, and the risks become too great. Um, I think I may have learned that when I was working for Victor, um, and <laughs> if you know of his track record. But the uh, did Victor learn it from Victor? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, anyway, God love um, we. Uh, so we started the automation process, I think, in, in earnest in the, in the mid-90s, and that has been the story for our company pretty much ever, ever since. Uh, in the meantime, I wanted to, I saw other firms that were, I think, very effective in this arena, and they had savvy trading desks with uh, uh, veteran traders that had come off the floor and had helped them with the execution. Uh, so I wanted to actually build a, an automated platform and a trading desk at the same time just to sort of hedge my bet. Well, the automated platform eventually won out eight, nine, ten years later, and we went from a 25-man trading desk to right now about seven or eight. And that seems to be enough. And we're still looking very, very seriously at what, what's going on on the trading desk because it is so much about automation and it's so much about speed and uh, so important for us to capture the bid ask spread. The margins in our trading have come down over the years significantly. Uh, I, I, I think if we're able to capture 20% of what we were able to capture in the mid-90s, it, it would be a high number. So the efficiencies that are required for what we're doing have been, um, it's been incredibly demanding and I think that uh, it has required that I've changed my thinking because you know I drew my ideas from uh, sort of a qualitative, uh, empirical, uh, inductive process of trading the markets and then bringing that to the research platform. But now it has, it, even the research has become incredibly complex, and these and th these are the challenges that uh, we're faced with. Uh, we're competing with high frequency shops. Uh, and would love to have their edge, in fact, uh, and I think we may be able, we may be able to achieve that as we go along, but the, and then feed that back into the client, uh, the client's pocket, so to speak. Um, but that that is a, where we are, I think, in a nutshell. Uh, uh, it's demanding. It's required uh, a tremendous amount of change uh, in our business. Personally, it's required a tremendous amount of change, uh, a recommitment and uh, to regenerate the firm and to take it to uh, to modernize it and uh, compete in the present environment is, is it reminds me of the beginning days of my business. Uh, it's very gratifying to see some success in doing that, and it's it's it it also keeps me keeps me busy and well occupied. So. Uh, with that, I'll pass. I'll pass the mic. John, my next. Okay, um, I'm John Taylor. I I am the oldest, I guess, in the in the 
this group by quite a bit, I'm afraid. I was hearing that you started in 1980. I was out in Chicago in 1973. Um, basically, I, my career spans almost everything. One of my first bets was, uh, was earning $20 betting that gold could devalue uh, in, on August 15th, 1971. Um, it's one of my prouder trades because everybody in the office thought I was crazy. Um, but this market started off uh, looking at things very, very differently than it looks at it now. Um, when I was starting, we were all fundamental. Um, when I left Citibank in, uh, in the end of the 70s, we had, uh, I had working for me two IMF people, an OECD, um, and, uh, um, and, a, and a Fed person. And the idea was to know what the heck was going on in the markets. And we were organizing Citibank's trading desk every day. Um, and I loved it because I would have these guys sitting up there and we'd all be there at 7.30 in the morning and we would give our, our outlooks and different things that were going to happen and what happened with the news overnight. And then I sat on the trading desk because I was talking to customers a lot. And we would start trading and we never paid any attention at all to what the economists said. We went off somewhere else, right? And um, we were slow. Citibank, you know, somebody wrote an article in 78 about uh, everything but the kitchen sink. Um, and that was what the analysis was about. And then the, the conclusion was is that we were worse than random. Um, and that was embarrassing, right? And I also had some people coming in, and I had been in Chicago at the First National Bank um, in 73, and had been on the board of the uh, um, CM, CME uh, as Bob uh, Abood's deputy. One very strange place to be, because you can't, could, anybody who knew Bob Abood knew that he was a crazy man, and you could never be his deputy because he never believed anything and you know, told you you were an idiot every day. <laughs> So I went to these meetings and sat with Leo Malamud and uh, some gold guy who was very famous at the time and all kinds of characters. And, uh, and then went back to New York and forgot everything I learned in Chicago. Um, then I went into business on my own uh, after Citibank and my first job was on the knife. How many people ever heard of the knife? Did you hear of the knife? Yes. New York Futures Exchange. Um, and I realized how badly the futures exchange was doing. Two, two things happened. First, I was um, sitting um, in Goldman Sachs's place eventually. I got it. It had eight phone lines and, and four seats, and Goldman Sachs rented me the place for $15 a year. Um, and the business was very slow, to say the least. But we arbed between Chicago and New York, and we made some money. And then I realized that we were dying when we came to a settlement date, um, and Solomon Brothers had the largest outstanding position, and we were second. And I thought we were two guys, right? So um, we moved upstairs then. And uh, what were you uh, we were trading your dollar futures. That was where, where Solomon Brothers was. And, and you know, that's another story because Chicago thought your dollars were stupid. And I was from New York and I was from Citibank. I knew your dollars were the center, right? And so therefore Knife was actually good at euro dollars until it just eventually evaporated. Um, but so we went from that to trend following and basically trend following uh, took over everything in the, in the late 70s and it came out of Chicago. Um, and that was great. Um, all kinds of studies showed that it worked much better than everything else, and so, uh, so we did it. And, and uh, I remember a guy who was from Oppenheimer who had a four-day, 21-day moving average crossover model on the Canadian dollar, and he was making tons of money, and he was lording it around Citibank, and we, I was just like, you know, get out of here, will you? Um, but then I tried it, and of course I was like, oh my God, what are we doing? Um, one of the most famous trend followers in the currency area had a system that his, I don't think he's using today, but it was basically just a one-year momentum. And he didn't even look at the market except once a week um, and once a month in some cases and compared where we were, you know, a year ago. And if it was above, he bought it. If it was below, he sold it. And he actually uh, made a lot of money and is a publicly traded company in the UK. and. Uh, and I'm embarrassed that I haven't done as well as he has. Um, the next thing that changed the market, I mean, everybody started to be trend following, and then, of course, it didn't work. Um, and I think that that's where Toby got to be very good because he didn't do that, right? Um, and uh, um, uh, Victor uh, knew better, and, and Toby 
brought it to a higher level. But carry became the next thing. Um, and theoretically, in the 70s, when I started, uh, you know, all the professors, Rick Levitch, who was, was Rick at the time, now he's Professor Levitch, um, was telling me that, uh, you know, the covered interest rate arbitrage uh, was the way to understand the foreign exchange market. And, you know, you couldn't possibly invest in currencies that had higher yields uh, and make money. Um, but when the EU convergence came along in the 80s, all of a sudden we all made a living off of uh, 80s, 90s, I guess that was, right? Mm -hmm. No, 80s. Sorry, I'm too old. Um, and uh, the living was, uh, you know, um, investing in the Italian lira and borrowing the German mark. And the interest rate spread was, well, varying between 5 and 12, 15 percent. And every three or four years, Italy would blow up in a horrific explosion, and everybody would lose money. Um, and then everybody would go back into the trade because the spreads were higher. And we, uh, through the late 70s into the beginning of the, uh, the euro, um, we all made a lot of money doing that. And then the euro came around by 1998, 1997. That game was over because the spreads were too narrow. Nobody could make any money. Um, and we went through a period where, oh my God, foreign exchange is dead. Uh, there's nothing to invest in. Um, we all almost died. Um, and, and the weird thing was because of the euro carry trade, the internal euro carry trade, we went through between 1990 four and 2000 and never had a year with under 15% performance and nobody gave us a dime. I mean, we had, it was the hardest thing to sell because they all said, well, the S&P is, you guys are crazy. We'll give money to a stock picker. Um, then, then we were dead. Uh, but then along came the emerging markets and the carry trade was reborn because everybody saw, you know, Poland, you know, was going to join the EU and Poland was paying 18% and, uh, geez, you know, this was going to narrow, right, to maybe zero when they joined the Euro. Well, it's now 20 years later and they haven't joined. Well, 15 years later. Um, but so that trade, the Euro, the emerging markets trade became the, the, the life's blood for uh, this business. Um, and then came 2008 and the curtains went down game was over. Carry was a mess, went up and down all the time. Carry didn't work, I mean, trend following didn't work. Um, we went into what I call tea leaf reading, Kremlinology, and correlation. Um, and that mixed bag sometimes was okay, and sometimes was terrible. Um, and that is really where we are today. In fact, uh, there's a letter out there that I wrote last night kind of trying to warm me up thinking about this, uh, which is called, what's it called? I forget what I write almost immediately. Uh, trend, central banks, and confusion. Um, there's no trend following anymore because the Fed is scared if it goes down there and the Fed is scared if it goes up there. So the Fed is going to be on both sides of the market and you know that trend following doesn't work because when you put a stop loss or take profit on a trend following system, it makes money compared to just letting the trend following system run. And that's a sin in trend following. You ought to, you ought to let the market run and go where it's going to go. Um, but when I found out that we had all these wonderful stop loss structures that were improving our trend following performance, I said, oh my God, trend following isn't there anymore. Um, so what's, that brought Kremlinology around to find out when the Fed was in fact going to say this. Um, and it's gotten more and more insane. Witness tapering. God, it's been an awful couple of months, right? Um, the only thing that's been good is that the tapering is, is uniformly bad for emerging markets, so therefore they look like hell and there's money to be made there. But other than that, it's a nuthouse. So what has happened in the currency business lately, I think, is, is twofold. It comes back, really, to a lot of the stuff. I bought Toby's 1989 book for, I don't know, $900. Uh, because it was one of the ones he didn't manage to stomp out um, because it had a lot of really, really good short trading ideas and we copied it, I don't know, 50 times um, and gave it to all the people starting off saying, here, here's this great idea from Crable, see if you can make it work. Um, some did, some didn't, right? Um, but it's become now that, that, that Toby has high frequency trading envy or whatever and, and and that's really where the market is going. There are high-frequency traders out there who trade like Goldman Sachs. They make money 
uh, 60 days out of 62 and a quarter and tell you there was a crappy quarter. Um, Jesus, we had two days where we lost money. I can't believe it. Um, but in fact, that's what this really high frequency trading allows the banks to do if they have incredibly good you know, measures of what's going on. And I'm no, I'm on the Fed's Foreign Exchange Committee, and so I sit there with all of these guys, um, and I'm one of seven people who is outside of the bank. So all the big banks are sitting there saying what they're doing to each other and all that stuff. And one of the guys said, well, I know that I make money off of Taylor because I can keep his positions for 10 seconds and they're still profitable. And if I'm stupid enough to hold them for 11 seconds, I deserve to lose money. Well, that was one of the big four banks in the foreign exchange business. And you've got to imagine what the hell they know, that they know my trading's coming in and what happens to it and how much they can make off of it, right? Because the spreads are here, there, whatever. So we are totally automated. We don't have any traders anymore. Um, and uh, that's not fair. We have two guys who basically sit and watch machines um, and execute in things like Indonesia, which you can't trade. Um, and, uh, and that's it. The trader, the high price traders are gone. They went to Graham. They went to, I don't know. They go to you. No. <laughs> Probably not. We're not basically not hiring these guys very much anymore. So, so that's become the basis of the market. And we have a stat R model, I would call it, that holds positions on average of six hours, and it's up 26% this year. We have a trend following slash carry model that is the mainstay of all of our corporate, you know, pension fund type business, and it's down three. Um, we have an options model uh, that, uh, that does something else. It does what we, I mean, next thing I'm going to talk about is currency betas, because um, one of the currency betas is skew, that people are scared of the risk out in the wing. So they, you know, they buy, try to get out of their risk out there, and they're wrong. They get out of the risk too much. So there are what the market is calling currency betas. So this is the other end. It's really short-term stat arb, and it's really long-term. God, currency is actually better than the stock market. If you put your money into a skew portfolio, which is what we do in our, re, in our, in our options business. We're up 17% this year. Um, nobody will buy it, it's too confusing. We have, we have some money in it, but not a hell of a lot. Um, you basically are getting something that will always be there. People are always scared of the unknown. They're always going to the banks and buying options um, and help. We'll sell them to them too, um, except that we're you know, not a bank. Um, so carry and skew are now getting to be known as really good betas, right? And you can invest, in fact, there's an ETF in the London Exchange where you can invest just in a carry um, portfolio. And from 2001 to now, um, it's got a better return than the London Stock Exchange by something like 1%. Um, it changes, of course, all the time because it's so tight. But it has one third of the volatility. And it's an ETF. It doesn't do a damn thing except hold that portfolio. So, you know, and so maybe its best years were 2001 to 2007, but it's still a good deal. So SKU is the way, which is really long term, that's what the pension funds will buy. And stat ARB is really short term, and that's what, you know, we will do for a living. That's the future. You know, John, you actually mentioned something that I think harken back to uh, what Toby had said. Toby, I, I, I wrote down one of your quotes. He said that the policymakers create chaos and therefore opportunity. And John, I think what you are referring to here as well is that there's intervention by policymakers that is creating, at least for the time being, a different market dynamic. Could that lead to opportunity though as well? So not only in Toby's shortest term strategies where he's able to identify uh, s some of this new, this new market structure, but even for a longer term player like yourself or, or or Mike will get to you eventually as well. You're a longer term player when you're potentially the models can adapt or the policymakers can no longer maintain this type of, 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 of strict control over markets. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I've, I've listed here what was going on today and I put down tea leaf Kremlinology uh, and correlation just trying to figure out what other markets are there. And because of lots of times, you know, that's the Bernanke put. 
uh, that he's going to operate because there's too much froth in the market, because there's not enough froth in the market. So um, that, uh, and we know that the concepts of government employees are not the concepts of the market. Uh, in fact, Bernanke has got absolutely no idea about the market. Um, and uh, uh, no expertise. Um, Dudley has expertise in the market, but he's not in charge, right? Um, and so um, what they're doing eventually we're going to break out of, and it's going to be a real problem, right? We're going to explode out of one side or the other, which is my point in my letter here. Um, that, uh, um, but you don't even know which side it's going to be. So I think it's very, very hard for any systematic trading system to, to trade the Kremlinology bit. Yeah. Unless it's really short, and even in our stat arb type models, when it starts, when the vol starts to blow up because Bernanke is starting to speak, we stop trading. We don't want to be trading with the government. Yeah. Mike, I've uh, <clears throat> decided that I'm going to fire my hairdresser because I asked her to give me some distinct gray highlights for the day, <laughs> and it appears that she failed me. So. I think on that, uh, on that note, um, if I could be the poster boy for anything in the hedge fund industry, it's, it would certainly be succession planning. Uh, Campbell and Company is you know, the oldest firm in the room, um, but I'm the youngest, and I think that that represents you know, three generations of leadership in transition. So Keith Campbell ran our firm for the first 20 years. Uh, Bruce Cleland and Terry Bex, who many of you know, ran it for the next 20 years. And now our co -head of, former co-head of research, Will Andrews, is our CEO, and I'm the former director of trading and, and the president of Campbell and & Company, and hopefully we'll be running it for the next 20 years. So I think that that's something that is probably coming up in, in many of your meetings with managers as you talk about um, what, who will be the next uh, generation of leadership. I just flew in uh, yesterday from Kansas City. I was out there talking to a number of kind of oil magnets and tycoons uh, in the plains. And uh, as you can imagine, they're, they're pretty concerned about you know, various kind of macro events that are happening around the world. We talked a little bit, John's comments about the <clears throat> central bank intervention we've seen in unprecedented form over the last few years. And you know now some of these issues that just won't go away, certainly there are concerns about the emerging markets and China slowing. Uh, the Middle East, uh, we thought we just had issues with Iran and Syria. Now Egypt has raised its head again. Uh, we certainly know that uh, our politicians in Washington cannot get things together and are arguing yet again on the debt ceiling. And Europe uh, will probably be with us for some time to come as Greece is back in the headlines again this morning. So as we focused on many of those issues in our discussions, they kept referring to them as macro risks. And I had to correct them and say that from my standpoint, they are macro opportunities. In many cases, they, they do start new trends that our models can take advantage of. Um, and I think that if there were two things that they were focused on, first, um, as we've already heard, the, the taper talk uh, of recent has created quite a bit of volatility, which has been difficult for, for some managers in the space. Uh, and I think that these particular investors were very keen on protecting some of the risk to their bond portfolios. Uh, some of you may have seen a white paper that, that our firm pr uh, produced earlier in the year that focused on uh, managers, types of investments that can profit in a rising interest rate environment. And certainly, I believe that uh, managers in the managed futures space, um, what our findings were over the last 40 years is that uh, with our ability to be sh you know, short global bond futures, we can offer a bit of a hedge. Um, and then you know, it goes without saying that um, everybody thinks of the 2008 scenario with being able to protect against the equity positions in a portfolio. And I think that as we look at the end of quantitative easing in, in the United States and people worry about will there be a substantial pullback in equity prices, you know, do I have CTAs in the portfolio to take advantage of 2008? I corrected this particular investor because I said, you know, it's easy to focus on 2008. I like to think about, you know, managed futures in, in large part over the last 40 years. Uh, one of my favorite statistics, and, and it's based on our returns, but I think you can pretty much overlay this on top of uh, most CTAs, is that in our 40 years, we were profitable on a calendar year basis in 31 of them. Uh, and though that's impressive, what I'd focus on with investors is the fact that in the nine years that we were not profitable, the S&P 500 was up in eight of them. So there was only one year in our 40-year history, uh, 1981, where we were both down and the S&P was down. And so and I talk about kind of non-correlated returns and having them in the portfolio, certainly that's a difficult discussion over the last few years where CTA returns have been a bit weaker than people would like. And in an environment where central bank intervention continues to push the equity markets to new highs, 
So for a matter of basis points, you're able to get a 10 to 15% return. Uh, there may be obviously higher levels of risk, um, but many investors have started to move away from CTAs in a period of time where I think that they need them more than ever. I think when I, uh, George and I talked about um, this morning's uh, remarks and I thought about, you know, what, what keeps me up at night? What are the risks out there uh, that we all need to be focused on? The first one that came to mind was certainly the current, and current regulatory environment. I think we can all agree that um, every type of, of hedge fund and, and alpha manager out there spends way too much time worrying about whether or not they're in compliance with the latest and greatest regulation, whether it's here domestically or now the new AFMIT in Europe. Um, I joke, joke with uh, Tracy Wills, a potter, head of marketing, who many of you know is in the room, that uh, when she goes to Europe in a few months, she's going to have a stack of legal documents with her when she goes to a cocktail party. Please sign here before we start having a conversation. Um, and that, that's really how absurd in many cases uh, we've gotten. Keith Campbell, uh, recently out in Chicago, received a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, out from the CME and the Pinnacle uh, Awards. And it was interesting in his comments uh, the question that was posed to him was, w what advice do you have for new startup managers in the room, new, new CTAs that are just getting, you know, cutting their teeth? And Keith said, you know, if I knew what I knew now, 40 years ago, and I knew all of the challenges and all of the hurdles, particularly on the regulatory side, I don't know if I would have started Campbell & Company in 1972. And um, I think that's something that's very real that uh, is a concern for many. Um, as I focused uh, on, on other risks out there on the horizon, certainly counterparty risk is something that we haven't talked about as an industry for some time because we haven't had one of the institutions get into trouble in the short term. But as I look back and I think about how we've responded and how many other managers have, um, we've been doing uh, real-time monitoring of CDS prices, equity prices, credit ratings, the rumor mill. Uh, in real time. And I know that though we were doing it before the Lehman crisis, many managers weren't, have now moved into that space. We, like everyone else, have full counterparty redundancy. And so what that means in my mind is when the next crisis happens, it's going to happen a lot quicker than the last few. Lehman Brothers took about two months. We stopped trading with them about two weeks into the, into the rumor mill and uh, didn't have any clearing with them, so we were okay when they went under. MF Global took about two weeks. We traded with them as well. We didn't clear with them. I think we got uh, out of executing with them two or three days into the crisis and, and we're safe. As I think about the, the time horizon narrowing, I, I believe that the next crisis in many cases may take two days because as everyone is prepared and as everyone is quick uh, on the trigger, uh, many people will move away. And so my fear is, is that somebody um, gets themselves into a little bit of trouble and it gets exacerbated where the entire street moves away from them. Um, I think that's something certainly to, uh, to keep on the horizon. I think technology, and, and you've heard this from, from Toby, uh, has been a game changer in our industry. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think about our models and how we back test. Uh, when I joined Campbell 14 years ago, in some cases, some of our uh, more robust um, strategies took, in some cases, hours to days to back test, even on grid computing. Now we're able to do that with new technology in a matter of seconds. So it's advancing research uh, at an incredible pace. With that, though, comes uh, an incredible price. Uh, there's really no number that you can't spend on new technology out there. And though I think that helps new entrants into the marketplace, it also creates a bit of a divide between the large you know, billion-dollar established managers with large capital bases who have million-dollar technology budgets and the three you know, guys from Goldman Sachs that just left because of Dodd-Frank and are starting a startup fund. Um, and the investment in required in order to do technology. I talked to Keith about the costs of market data and what it looked like 40 years ago. In many cases, it was free. It was given away by the exchanges. Now the folks at Bloomberg and Reuters are charging a hefty penny uh, for access to that data. So once again, it's not surprising to me when I see more investments going into larger funds and that the smaller startup funds are, are struggling um, as they uh, labor under some of those costs. I think about uh, risks around our facility. We do all of our trading in Baltimore, three, three shifts a day, 24 hours a day. And we've hardened that site as well as building a disaster recovery site several miles up the road. But one of the things we learned a few years ago was that earthquakes do in fact happen on the East Coast. And uh, as the building was shaking, the first thing I thought of was our server racks down beneath me in the data center, as well as the server racks at our DR site 20 minutes up the road, which we had very smartly put on another power grid, another telecom grid, but they were being shaken the same way that, that our servers were in our primary location. 
So as we talk about um, faster trading and high frequency, I don't have envy for them as much, but I've learned a tremendous amount from them on the technology front. And now we've started to co-locate some of our servers not to be faster, though we like being faster, and there's certainly some cost savings there. It's more about being in a data center close to a major exchange where everybody else in the marketplace is there, so I don't have to run you know, several thousand dollar lines from Baltimore to New York and Chicago. I can run one fat pipe to a data center in New York or Chicago and have my equipment there. And then more importantly, I'm further kind of diversifying my asset base by having boxes all over the world so that if something happens to us in Baltimore, uh, we are further protected. So uh, Colo definitely is something that is on our agenda as it is with many managers in the space. We've heard some comments about automation. Um, automation has definitely been something that we focused on and has made our firm better, but it de definitely scares me. I think about what has happened recently at Knight Capital uh, with the dormant code and, uh, and with a lack of monitoring. Um, I like to tell people, our clients specifically, that we all know that you know 80% of a flight from London to New York is on autopilot. We can use algorithms to do a lot of the, those types of jobs for us. But when I fly home to Baltimore today, I don't want to take the pilot out of the cockpit for you know, $100 you know, cheaper on my ticket. My thought process there being, I, I think about Captain Sully landing that plane on the Hudson. Uh, I don't think even the best algorithmic developer would have written the code for how to do that. So um, we are seeing a, a shrinking number of traders on our desk, but we continue to have a commitment to having human beings at least there in a monitoring capability so that they're there to watch for counterparty risks. They're there to monitor and talk to uh, both regulators and our partners about what are the, what are the risks on that front. They may, been, may not be doing the ones doing the trading, but they're certainly passing valuable economic information and market data and costs to our researchers who are developing the strategies. I have a friend that works for Boeing, and, and after the Knight Capital fiasco with Algos Gone Wild, I asked him about how they think about testing and monitoring systems. And they told me that when they build a 747 in many cases, it's not the engine or the body, you know, when you think about how big they are, that really takes, uh, is the longest period of time to develop those planes. It's actually all of the technology that goes into the cockpit for monitoring and alerting when things go bad. And what's interesting is he says that 80 to 90 percent of those systems hopefully never get used in the life cycle of an airplane, but yet they still have to spend weeks upon weeks testing them and making sure that they work. It was interesting because I asked him the question about how much testing and monitoring are happening on Wall Street, and he asked me, posed the question to me, if you took the technologists from Wall Street and put them at Boeing, would you get on an airplane? And I had to think long and hard about whether or not I would. So I think that's something that we all need to, to consider. Finally, on the client-facing front, we've had a lot of new developments. Uh, Toby and I have both launched 40 Act funds in, in recent months. I'm not sure whether or not uh, John has plan plans to get into that space. I think what's interesting there is, is in many cases, people believe that you know, mutual funds are a retail investor's uh, product. And for us, we've actually seen just as much, if not more, demand from the institutional community as there are many people in the private bank, in the pension fund, and endowment space that embrace 40 Act funds, uh, realize that they, that they would like to gain hedge fund in, in investments uh, in that, that conduit and uh, are approaching us on that front. It's something that has surprised me a bit, but is certainly out there uh, and being talked about. Probably the biggest trend on the client-facing side is customization. As uh, folks come to us, in many cases, when I started at Dean Witter as a product development analyst, we were building product. Um, we put it out there and people bought it. Now they come to us and say, I want X, I want Y, I want Z. They look at our, our uh, wealth of strategies, like a menu effectively, and they just start picking this one and that one and blending them at different volatility levels. Uh, I think that's a trend that will continue. Most recently, the trend that we're seeing is, is to the smart beta side as people once again want to have that 2008 protection from CTAs, but they want to have it cheaper. Uh, a friend of mine recently said people want Walmart prices with Nordstrom service. Uh, and we're clearly seeing that in the space as more people come to us and say, can you give us some basic trend following models with a single look back? Uh, and we want to pay a lot lower for that. Uh, not everyone in the industry is going that direction, but it is something that we've seen more and more of, and we're have, having to uh, step up to the plate to customize for them. Finally, on the due diligence front, um, I can't believe uh, where we've come, particularly since post Madoff. You know, every investor spends at least a day, sometimes two, in our offices. We have two teams that come through in most cases, both investment and ops due diligence. Uh, it's incredibly taxing on our teams, and I can't imagine how smaller funds get through it. 
Uh, recently, I was hearing that ops due diligence is no longer a rubber stamp, that ops due diligence effectively has veto power on most investment committees. So if you're not doing things correctly in many cases as a manager, they have the ability to stand uh, between you and a new investment. Um, and, and I think that due diligence will only uh, continue to grow in the future. Lastly, I'll just say on the alpha generation side that uh, there's been a popular theme, and John's alluded to it with trend following, whether or not there's overcrowding in the space. We've certainly seen uh, a, a degrade in CTA returns, and, and people ask the question, as money flowed into the space after 2008, will that be a problem for the industry going forward? Uh, fortunately, at Campbell, we've worked to diversify ourselves away from trend following, added a lot of non-trend following strategies. And if you look at our outperformance in recent times, a lot of that has come from some of those lowly correlated strategies that aren't specifically doing trend following. We're actually working on, on the topic right now as a, as a research piece. And uh, if our findings are solid, uh, we hope to publish that in a, in a white paper in the months to come. But I think that's a topic that as an industry we're going to continue to talk about. Thank you for having me this morning. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you actually covered a lot of very interesting uh, topics. I'd like to address maybe one or two of those with a couple of other of the panelists before we move out to the rest of the room, if you don't mind. So, so one is uh, the impact of regulation and the impact of technology costs and how that could potentially set a higher barrier to entry for a new market participant. So if you're uh, a smart guy with some ideas on how to how to put together a model that could trade uh, a broadly diversified portfolio of futures. It's much harder to do so now with the added cost than maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Do you have any concern that that's going to create some, uh, or that's going to lead to consolidation within the managed future space? So uh, we've seen it with some. We've seen Winton at one point cross $30 billion. Uh, we, we've seen a couple of the other larger of the trend followers in the tens to $20 billion uh, levels as well. Is this, uh, sh should this be of concern to you? Is, is this something uh, that as a multi-billion dollar firm yourself, you've seen a little bit of this and will likely see more of it going forward. Is this something that we need to protect against as an industry? Uh, not just a single manager even. To you, please, Sam. Well, I think one of the things that's really interesting is, um, you know, if you look at the May-June performance cycle, uh, there were certainly some large marquee names that had significant uh, negative returns in that period. And <clears throat> we were down 1.5% collectively over May and June. And I've never been so happy about being down 1.5%. Um, I think that as we focus on overcrowding, in many cases, there were a lot of managers with very similar positions. And when things started to turn, and Bernanke talked about tapering, uh, in particular the bond market certainly went from um, what had been a very strong uptrend for a long time and quickly reverted. Ten-year yield started making a <clears throat> strong move up towards 2.7%. I think there were a lot of managers, um, to John's point about stop losses, that were getting out of those positions and quickly trying to get the other way. And with billions of dollars behind that, in many cases, uh, it may have exacerbated some of the losses. Um, when I look at our suite of models, um, as I said, it was our non-trend following strategies in many cases that were the outperformer during those periods, and our trend following um, systems in many cases on the medium-term time horizon from one, one to three months um, did get hurt. Uh, but fortunately, some of our shorter-term and some of our longer-term systems um, fared better in, in that environment. So I think it's a, it's a real problem in the industry. Um, but that, you know, like, like always, there will be a reallocation um, of assets in the industry from one manager to the other, uh, and maybe there will be a bit more balance to people with, with more diversity. I think people built fund-to-funds products thinking that they had three unique managers and found over the last two months that they had three managers that may have had a higher correlation than they expected. So there may be some kind of rejuggling. John, I'm curious to hear your perspective, uh, specifically on trend following now, uh, given the fact that you have pointed to some of this mitigation of the tails by policymakers leading to some of the underperformance in the sector. Do you agree that there's an overcrowding issue here, or do you think that this is more a cyclical type of environment that we're in now, given the, the prevalence of intervention? Yeah, I believe it's more of a cyclical issue, right? Um, and I... Uh, you know, I mean, I, I respect the people who've managed to figure out the ways to make trend following work somewhat in this environment. Um, but I do believe that, uh, you know, that it, you know, the question is what percentage of the time is the market really trending and what percentage of the time is it is it range bound? 
right? And one of the reasons that STAT-ARB works is that, in fact, it's basically a range-bound structure, right? I mean, it's, I've said, my God, we're all of a sudden Wall Street people, right? We're doing the same kind of deals that, that the banks do. Um, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, st the biggest problem for, you know, for a mean reversion type structure is, in fact, a, a big trend. So what's the balance between the mean reversion and the trend? It's, uh, uh, it changes. We used to define that always by markets. In currency trends were dominant because they were too hard to calculate. Um, in uh, fixed income, they weren't um, because, in fact, the model that you understood fixed income by was understandable. So you knew the price was too high or you knew the price was too low. But in currency, there was no understandable model um, for currency value. So trend following was very important. It's, it's, it's called model uncertainty. As you get more and more model uncertainty, then your market looks at, a, at, at the instrument and says, oh my god, the thing is going up. I'm going to get punished if I'm not on board. Um, and um, you know, I'm going to lose money, and everybody's going to think I'm an idiot uh, because somebody must know something. That's why it's going up, and so therefore the trend continues. But when there's a clear model that says the thing is worth less than what it is at this height, you know, things change. Now there's a model today, and that model is the is the government, right? And so that's why I think that uh, uh, you know it, it is cyclical. Um, but the question really is, is: Does the government lose it? You know, like they have in India, for instance, recently, um, and we go off in a big trend whether they want it or not, or, or, or Brazil lost it for a while and now has gotten it back. So um, there's the, you know, it's, it's hard to define whether that's going to be, uh, um, you know, an ongoing cyclical change or whether it's just a short-term one that's going to hit one country or another. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'd like to open it up to the crowd now as well, please. I'm curious to know how the uh, growing presence of exchange-traded funds has uh, impacted uh, your strategies in the business of systematic trading. Toby, you want to start with this one, maybe, or, or not? Sure. All right. 30 seconds. Uh, ooh, uh, we, we really need liquid uh, traded uh, instruments. It, the ETFs, as some of them really trade a lot. But there's, we're, we're tending towards futures and foreign exchange, so it's not really our ballywick. Um, there are some uh, roles and pressures that take place in very short-term uh, periods that are interesting to us because there's, they have to do certain things. And if we can pick up that pattern, then that's interesting. Um, uh, but that's that's from where I sit. Uh, Did you pick it up? I mean, is that something? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I've just tried to think. Um, yes, there are things that happen. I mean, if, if there's a, a lot of capital that has to move at a certain time, uh, that can benefit us. Um, years ago, um, okay, if, if you're a 24-hour trader and you have, and you are going to trade 24-hour periods, that means you get in today and you have to exit tomorrow at the same time, there's a half hour push in the opposite direction the next day. Just to give you an example, that's, that's in sort of the micro world. And if uh, we don't do that, of course, we're not so stupid to, to do something like that, of course, but people do that. And they, and they trade on the five minute, and they trade on the 30 minute, and they, they're, they're geared to these very rigid sort of uh, anchors and patterns, and that uh, there's some benefit for us to to uh, to model that. But uh, yeah, I think if you can pick up what the institutions or the, the people that have to trade are doing, then you can you can benefit from it. From yeah, in the, Do any of the other in the foreign exchange market I'm, I'm really along that line? I mean, the ETFs are um, there are two different ways that we see the ETFs. One is its competition, like for instance, for a simple beta strategy, right? Uh, the ETF is a comp competition where somebody says, well, why the hell am I going to pay you for, for this sort of function, which isn't that difficult to handle, um, when I can get it for less. Um, on the other hand, the ETFs do the kinds of things that, 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 that Toby is talking about. And, and in the foreign exchange market, it's fascinating. 
I mean, there's an hour and there's a half hour thing every single minute, right? We know when that's there. You trade. You don't trade at the hour. You trade 59. You trade a one. Right, which means that we have a regime well, in there that's screwing it up <laughs> too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, but but uh, it's rather strange to see those things are out there all the time. I would just add that uh, though we don't trade ETFs, we use them as a, an indicator. So um, when you think of trend following, uh, you know you, you use the underlying price of the instrument to directly trade it. In some of our non-trend following strategies, we can use data in any form from anywhere. And so some of our cross-sector strategies use ETF data uh, to effectively position potentially in another asset class. Um, I'll also mention that um, when you think about the four asset classes that we trade, fixed income, equities, currencies, and commodities, commodities, though that's where our our industry started and why we're called CTAs, um, has become the, the least liquid of the four. And so as commodity ETFs over the years have been launched and more investors have come into that space, um, it has added liquidity and has added um, a unique perspective with investors who may have uh, different drivers for why they're buying and selling that may be different than ours um, and, and that additional liquidity, which then certainly from the hedging basis uh, as ETFs are created, you know, flip flows through the futures markets, um, helps us to be able to trade more and reduce our cost basis. And really more from an industry uh, perspective now because I speak with many managers that do attempt to exploit some of the opportunities that can arise from ETFs, especially levered ETFs, for example. Uh, there are, in any methodology that the rules are being really broadly communicated. So John mentioned that he bought Toby's book for $900 because he outlined some of the rules in this book that he was using in his trading. Whenever there are any of these uh, uh, funds or, or benchmarks, whatever it may be, that are tradable, that have their guidebook that's published, there will be somebody out there looking to exploit some of the weaknesses in that. So there will be opportunities for people. There have been opportunities for people to do so in the past. Some of the people on this on this panel even may take advantage of it in different ways, uh, but some are doing it very explicitly. Any other questions? I have a yeah. question. I'm curious. Um, we've seen, in my 30-plus years in the business, we've seen CTAs grow to... $30 billion, I think, is the high for an individual. I guess Bridgewater could even be, has parts of their business that are even larger. Um, are, is these size, these large managers that are following trend, are they following trend or are they creating trend is question number one. I guess for the, the long-term trend follower in the group and for the short-term trader, the question is, are you modeling to take advantage of the turns when these behemoths turn? I mean, it's one thing to cross the ocean in the Queen Elizabeth and try to turn it around because there's a storm coming at you, and quite a different thing to turn that boat around if it's a small boat. So I'm curious as to how you, you guys look at that. Uh, I'll start off since I'm the uh, long-term trend follower at the, at the table. Um, our early research on overcrowding, I mean, certainly shows that if they were creating trends, the industry would have been much more profitable over the last, say, five years than it has been. So I think in many ways, and, and I think the other part of it is the regime that we've been in from a, a central bank intervention standpoint has not been uh, conducive to John's point about general market trends as they've been on, as he said, the bottom and the top of the market. Um, I think uh, as we focus you know, our efforts on the research going forward. Um, when we do the back test, you know, medium term trend following is still has one of the highest sharp ratios of any strategy in our portfolio. So we haven't given up on it. Um, we've just reduced the allocation as we've added new strategies in. And some of them, like, you know, short term mean reversion, actually, in many cases, does uh, take advantage of um, what we're seeing on the longer term trend side as uh, models get kind of whipsawed in and out. Um, I guess the difference is for us is that um, because we're running all these different strategies as opposed to a fund of funds where you're, you're allocating to several managers, we have the ability to net those trades internally. And so on some days, we may see as, me- as much as two-thirds of our trades netted between the shorter-term reversion models and the longer-term trend models. Those trades never hit the street. There's no cost to doing them. 
Um, but I wonder, as people are out there allocating to those different strategies, how much one manager is going long, the other is going short, and there's a lot of fees and costs that are being paid, um, but there's not a lot of alpha being generated. Uh, for short-term trading, your transaction costs must be pretty high. What do you do to minimize the transaction costs? Um, to minimize the transaction costs uh, is where the IT comes in. Um, you know, in effect, what we have is really a, a dark pool. We have a we're co-located, um, worried about latency and all of those things. Um, we have a feed that has roughly 34 different prices at any time. So, in effect, when we're looking at 34 different prices, we pick the best price to trade at. And with a, with very short-term models that identify when this price is a good one. Now, we're not a high-frequency trader who will, you know, match two banks against each other because the bid and offers have crossed, right? Um, we'll just take the one that's wrong um, and hold that position and put that in for our longer term, you know, two hour or maybe two week position, just saying that's the cheap uh, trading cost. So we're trading basically for nothing um, when it comes out to it, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, something like, um, you know, 0.08 basis points or something over over a long time. And so for that reason, the systems work. If you were trading for, you know, one or two basis points, forget it, you would be losing. That, that, that works, but uh, other, what do you do about uh, trading on futures? Well, yeah, well it's... Exchange fees are extremely high on futures companies, right? Yeah, well, it's basically we don't trade uh, yeah, very many futures, right? Yeah. Okay. And maybe Toby can address some of this. Um, we, we beat up our, our brokers, certainly. <laughs> yes, that's first. <laughs> and then, and then uh, we keep working on our algorithms uh, to make them uh, brighter and uh, more perceptive about what's going on. And it kind of comes back to what Ken asked, is that uh, from where I sit, there's tremendous opportunity with all this uh, big trend-following money sloshing about in the markets. I mean... Um, uh, if you take a 10-minute low and you go through it and your your momentum is down that day, the market surely will go down another three or four ticks. To me, that's, uh, you know, with my margins somewhere around one and a half ticks per trade, mm. I'm pretty happy about that level of certainty that I get. And, uh, you know, a trend follower probably doesn't, doesn't mind so much the three ticks that he has to give up on. Uh, and that happens repeatedly. I find I find the trends are. Yesterday was a great example. The German boom market was trending down nicely all day, and looked like the we were we were done with the recent uptrend. And then it switched at 7:30 in the uh, or 8:30 in the U.S. and it com completely changed. And the same qualities that existed in the downtrend showed up in the uptrend uh, on a minute to minute basis. Uh, and even even lower in shorter time frames, but when you're trading that short, you just have to you have to cut costs. And in our firm, we've cut costs from some somewhere in the range of seventy to eighty percent over the last three or four years. But the industry has dropped costs also to to kind of match that. They're very they're somewhat aggressive. If they're not aggressive, they lose the business, and they have lost the business. Uh, you the just issue is the exchange fees. Well, it's not. It's seriously not not that isn't really the cost. The cost of trading is the execution. The exchange fees are minimal by comparison. Especially when you're a member. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I'm a member. That's right. I'm they, a member. It does make a big difference. But, <laughs> it does yeah. make a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. But you see, th that's not really all my department. I just tell them to get it done, <laughs> and then, then, then they do it. And, and they're just really just beating the hell out of it every, everywhere they can to lower costs. Otherwise, you know, that's part of our survival. So um, it's not it's not so much different than the computer industry if you ask me. I mean it, it's just this it's the same old same old thing going on everywhere in the uh, in the business world. Sorry. When you transact as frequently as Toby does, and even the rest of the members on this platform, it makes sense to either buy or lease memberships at at those exchanges where you trade most frequently. You can cut your costs by a dramatic margin. Just more on top of the transaction costs. Just given the kind of political environment in the U.S., in the Europe, and also in Europe, what do you guys assign to the probability of a transaction tax being taxed at some point? So just a total tax in Europe or something like that. And if it did, could you guys adapt to that? 
Exactly. Well, they, there'll be opening up an exchange, uh, let's see, somewhere in, uh, God knows, somewhere in Asia. Yes, Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they would be free, yeah. and there won't be a transaction cost, and all the business will move there. That'd probably take about a week. You know, I mean, it, it, really, they, they go ahead, put the transaction. Just, you, I don't know if you saw what happened when they said you couldn't short in the CAC uh, or the French stock market, and what, what was the other one? Other one, I don't know, Spain, Spain or something. Spain. Yeah. It changed the whole structure of the market. The volume dropped by fifty percent. Uh, it moved off to markets where you were, you were allowed to, to go short. Uh, I mean, the, the, the participants in these markets are, are some of the like, present company, except me, uh, are really some of the smartest people in the in the in the world. You know, going after profitability and. Um, uh, they'll, they they don't fool around with this, and 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 either do the exchanges. Uh, they're competing, and when you start throwing things as stupid as transaction costs onto, I remember the CME call this once. We were the, one of the bigger EFP traders in the foreign exchange market, and they said, well, you know, we're really thinking about raising our costs here uh, just a little bit. What do you think about that? <laughs> They didn't do it, thank thank goodness. And if they did, they would have lost a tremendous amount of business. And that's that, that is the the fact of those are that's the reality of the marketplace. Uh, I, I'm truly not very fearful of that. And also the restricting on frequency of trading. I, I think that's kind of a neat idea too. Uh, I kind of I kind of welcome the drama that goes along with them trying to do that. I mean, you know, it keeps life interesting. Uh, Mike, what about you, though, from the longer-term uh, perspective? Would the transaction costs help you, perhaps, getting out some of well, the we're, higher we're, frequency? We're certainly not as cost-sensitive as Toby and some of the shorter-term managers, but it would certainly have an impact on our strategies. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, a cash equity stat R model, and it trade. we just, in fact, just went live in Europe this year, and so something that we're watching very closely. But as I talk to, to people on that side of the pond, um, they point to the French as an example, and, and they have not been as successful as they thought they would be with their financial transaction tasks. I can't remember the percentage, but they haven't raised nearly the revenue that they thought they would. Mm -hmm. And to Toby's point, you see liquidity in those markets start to start to decline. And I think that's a great example to the rest of the world of, in many cases, it's a great thing for the politicians to jump up on a soapbox and talk about, but in the end, it ends up you know hurting your market in a way where. Um, not everybody comes back, right? You mean, the, the, if the experiment doesn't work and you say, okay, we're waiving the tax, uh, it do, not every investment committee immediately convenes and says, let's add France or some other country back into the mix. In some cases, you may have you know, damaged years of, of market uh, liquidity building. Um, so I, I'm not as concerned about it, but it is something I think that we all have on the radar. The transaction tax issue is not that simple. Uh, we have been collecting uh, the transaction taxes for French and Italian stocks for the past three months. And we have to pay that to the government. And yesterday, the French government uh, came out proposing a transaction tax on forex trade. Now, what will that do to forex trading is beyond so. We once had an office in France. We no longer do. <laughs> I like the French, but... Any other questions? I think we talked about the AUM. I'm just going to focus on the recent uh, prices. So we talked about the AUM, and I think we talk, might have talked about the interest rates on long bonds versus short bonds. Um, I would like to tie that up with uh, the volatility and some has different approaches to volatility, i.e., forcing a target law as opposed to that the opportunity set in the model. Is that is there anything we can add on the volatility part? Uh, I would um, I would say that um, when I when I look at what we've been doing in portfolio and risk management over the last say five years, one of the big focuses has been volatility, uh, specifically um, kind of developing a, a risk targeting model 
that would always keep us kind of at the optimal, what we believe to be the optimal uh, risk profile. Um, the, the, the real active debate in our research department is how fast to run that model, right? Because some argue that if you run it too quickly in real time, that if there's a spike in volatility, you may reduce positions, and then as we talk about costs, uh, your cost profile goes up pretty dramatically. So we've been running it kind of at this point several times a day, but not in real time as we continue to do kind of further research there. But I think that it's something that a lot of managers have embraced in the last five to ten years as we've had some significant crises with, with huge spikes in vol. And you, know, you put on 100 contracts of something thinking that you have a certain risk profile, and then that doubles intraday. Um, you don't need to have 100 contracts on to have that same you know, risk level. So at what point are you going to reduce that to 50? Um, and I think that that's, that's something that we're doing active research on. And as I talk to some of my peers in the space, I, I think it's, a, it's very topical and something that we'll be, continue to be focused on. Can I just add something to that? I hate chasing uh, volatility in a portfolio. I think it's our opportunities are jagged, and, and I, I just the clients like that, and I, I you know we try, but there are times when we will have a fifteen vol rather than an eight vol or a ten vol, and that's that can be acceptable. I think we really just have to watch out for uh, sort of catastrophic risk. I think uh, we're in this to to take advantage of the opportunities. Yeah, vol, vol is actually a terrible measure, um, I think. In fact, it, is, it tends to spike right, and, and, and revert very quickly, and, and so chasing it. There are other measures that should be used, I think, instead of vol. On the other hand, we didn't pay much attention to that prior to 2011, and our returns were uh, prior to the fourth quarter of 2011, and our returns were a lot uh, less uh, pretty uh, than they have been since then. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're still right because perhaps we've cut off the top side as well. So, I mean, I, we try very carefully to make sure that we look at vols related to value and to other things, right? We have one more question. Okay. Um, well, this is related really to the future part of this and, and where you all see the best opportunities going forward. And in particular, Toby. You said that you had a recommitment. Um, could you expand on that with us, um, in your talk? Um, <laughs> involved in that? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, we have two more. No, no, two more. We're getting the hook uh, I stopped ordering uh, Mouton Rothschild at dinner. I mean, no, okay. Um, let's see. I think it requires from time to time um, in a business if you're going to have longevity you, you have to you have to reinvent yourself and uh, what I'm doing now is far different than what I've done before I mean there are things that are similar but there are, there are things that are much different I mean the automation itself is just I'm not a programmer but that's essentially what I deal with uh, I, I work with people that have those skills and that's uh, that's something that I've had to work on and uh, and I think that that's, that's it. That's the business. The business is a computer business. It's a programming business. It's a mathematical business. And uh, the people skills that are, are required to, t to, to deal with those folks rather than traders or floor traders or scalpers is a completely different, different thing. So uh, it, it's required that I've, uh, I've done some, I, I've had uh, some intellectual growth over over the years, to say the least. Okay. Toby's suggesting that there are people skills needed to manage computers. <laughs> um, thank you, Mike, John, Toby, George. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, I would like to thank the Common Fund, who unfortunately couldn't join us, but they are sponsoring today's breakfast. Uh, I'd like to also remind all of you, if you would, please fill out your comment cards. And lastly, we are taking the month of August off. We'll see you back here in September. Thank you very much.